So our third panel today is titled The Administration of the Census. And it's moderated by the aforementioned editor-in-chief of the George Mason Law Review, Connor Woodfin. I'll briefly introduce uh, Connor and he'll take over. Connor is the editor-in-chief of the George Mason Law Review and a former Alexander Hamilton student fellow at the C. Boyd and Gray Center. He's a native of Lubbock, Texas, and attended Hillsdale College in Michigan, where he graduated magna cum laude. After graduating, he'll be clerking for Judge David Porter on the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. And I do want to say just a, a brief note. You'll notice in your program that one of our speakers, uh, Mr. Jesse Panuccio, is identified as a public service fellow. This is something new we've started at the Gray Center. We've already been collecting short policy papers from a variety of scholars like stu and practitioners like Stuart Eisenstadt, Sally Katzen, and others. Uh, a new paper uh, series will be rolling out at the Gray Center. And the Public Service Fellow Program, it was created to give people coming out of various parts of government an opportunity to write papers explaining for the public various aspects of their experience in government. So the public at large can benefit from the accumulated experience um, and learning of those who have served in government service. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Connor. Thank you, Professor White. Uh, thank you all for sticking around after that excellent lunch. Um, these next few panels are going to fly by, so we're just going to jump right into this discussion on the administration of the census. Uh, the focus of this discussion will be the Supreme Court's recent decision in uh, the Department of Commerce versus New York, which was the last case to come down from the 2018 term. Uh, the issue was whether the Secretary of Commerce violated the enumeration clause and the Census Act in choosing to reinstate the citizenship question on the 2020 Census Questionnaire. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts delivered the opinion of the court, but through a confusing arrangement of various concurrences and dissents, it turned out that he was the only one who actually agreed with all of his opinion. Uh, the court held that in choosing to include the citizenship question on the census, the secretary did not violate the enumeration clause, but it did remand the case to the agency on the grounds that the agency's stated reason for including the question was simply pretextual. So uh, Ronald Cass wrote the paper that will anchor this hour's discussion, and I won't say too much about your paper right now. I'll leave that, uh, leave that for you. Um, but at the risk of overreaching, I think it is uh, safe to conclude that um, you concluded that this case will incentivize uh, litigants to air their political disputes in court, uh, perhaps rather than on Capitol Hill. So I will briefly introduce each member of the panel um, as it is their turn to talk, and uh, their, their full biographies are, are in your program. So Ron Cass is, uh, as I said, the, the author for today's discussion. He's a Dean Emeritus of Boston University School of Law, where he was Dean from 1990 to 2004. He's a former Vice Chairman, Chairman and Commissioner of the U.S. International Trade Commission, the current Chairman and Resident Scholar at the Center for the Rule of Law, and President of Cass and Associates. He is a member of the Council of the Administrative Conference of the United States and has received six presidential appointments from Pre Presidents Ronald Reagan through Barack Obama. Uh, he has written, I think, perhaps ever, something on everything and published <laughs> everywhere. Um, but uh, perhaps most recently of interest to, to this audience, there's been a lot of discussion on nationwide injunctions. And although that's not uh, the focus of of this symposium per se, we are actually uh, publishing a piece on nationwide injunctions by Ron Cass in, uh, in the journal as well. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and as, as Professor White might have mentioned, he is also a, a distinguished senior fellow at the Gray Center. So uh, Ron, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. Usually when I follow Adam to the lectern, he leaves a box or something for me to stand on. Uh, I, I'm going to begin with what's obviously a true story involving a young rabbi who was new to his congregation and was officiating at a funeral. Uh, he did not know the deceased. And so after going through what are the uh, official parts of the ceremony, he informed the uh, attendees that he did not know the 
deceased, but would like someone in the audience or many people in the audience who knew the deceased to come up and say a few kind words about him. Nobody moved. Uh, the rabbi again said, this would be a good time for those of you who knew him. Please come up and say uh, a few words. Nothing. He said, anyone have something they want to share? Uh, you know, a, a nice anecdote, a kindness he did, uh, anything good about him? Nothing. Finally, after the, the rabbi goes through another round of entreaties, one person stands up and comes up to the front and the rabbi says, please, share your, your thoughts. He nods and said, his brother was voice. <laughs> and it is in that spirit that I'm going to talk about the uh, decision of the court in the census case. Uh, as, uh, as, as Connor mentioned, uh, the, the uh, focus of my commentary is about the case itself. I think it's important to start, though, with an understanding that the census is an important part of our democracy. It does set the framework for counting how many people are in each state, how many people are in each district, who gets assigned what sort of representative status. This is an important part of allocating both political power and financial rewards to different places. In the beginning of the nation, it was something that was a real source of controversy about how people should be counted, and particularly when it came to slaves, and that word does not appear uh, in the Constitution. But there was a big fight between states with large numbers of slaves who wanted them counted, one for one, and states that did not have as many, that did not want slaves counted at all. Uh, so this had nothing to do with people's views about slavery or about slaves as people. It had to do with political power and an understanding of who would receive political power. The significant thing from a democratic standpoint is that over the successive centuries, we have had the census done every 10 years without really much in the way of controversy about it. It has devolved from a matter of high political drama to a matter of administrative convenience and administrative uh, control. And even though people understand that decisions made by administrators will have an impact on the political rewards and the way they're distributed, it has rarely been something that has risen to a matter of judicial consideration, although it did this time. One of the first things that was at issue in the case is the question whether there was reviewability. Because the statute that was the underlying statute assigning authority to the Secretary of Commerce, which was uh, a recent, the most recent iteration of the Census Act, that statute gave great discretion to the Secretary of Commerce to design the census as he saw fit and to decide what went in the census. So both the, the nature of the questions and the way they were asked, the way the census is put together, is a matter that was really given over to the discretion of the Secretary of Commerce. So there was an argument in the district court uh, in the Southern District uh, of New York as to whether there was any reviewability under the Administrative Procedure Act. If there was reviewability, what were the terms of review? Uh, the review would be under the uh, first, uh, under Section 706 of the Administrative Procedure Act, under what's known as the Arbitrary uh, Capricious Clause, even though that has four separate reasons for uh, overturning administrative decisions. They generally cluster around problems of the exercise uh, of discretion. Uh, there were arguments about whether there had been violations of the Constitution or of the Census Act by the actions of the Secretary. And in a decision, in an opinion, that ran in manuscript form over 300 pages, uh, the uh, district judge found against the secretary on numerous counts, but included among them were that the secretary had not honestly stated what his views were. So let me just go uh, quickly over some of what's in the uh, decision and then talk a bit about it and my reactions to it. Uh, first, the one thing on which everybody in the court agrees 
is that there was no violation of the Constitution or of the statute. After that, people part ways. Uh, there was a plurality uh, of justices who thought there was a violation of the, uh, of, of the provision against uh, arbitrary, capricious, or abuse of uh, discretion uh, actions by the secretary because they thought the way he had decided to include the citizenship question again in the census was inappropriate, that it didn't rest on proper grounds, that it wasn't reasonable. Uh, they leaned very heavily on the disagreement between the secretary and members of the Census Bureau, who are people that have a lot of expertise uh, on this matter. And they thought that uh, the decision should have been overturned on that ground uh, of itself. Uh, the majority of the court, in the opinion by uh, the Chief Justice, said that Really, if you have looked at relevant issues, you have articulated a reasonable basis for what you've done, and the reasonable basis uh, matches the issues you've articulated, that's the end of it. And they particularly were careful in saying that courts should not go too deeply into second guessing the decisions of administrators when they have been given considerable discretion. Uh, the Court, in particular, the majority, uh, very strongly said the fact that somebody may have reasons other than the reasons articulated also is not a basis for overturning the decisions. And in particular, they singled out political reasons. Everybody understands that people who are political appointees occasionally act for political reasons. They're appointed for political reasons. They're responsive to people who have political considerations. They act for political reasons. But the court very clearly said that in and of itself is not a sufficient ground for overturning a decision. We expect that. We understand that these decisions don't take place in a vacuum. And they, they are not matters of mere academic concern. These are matters of practical concern that have political implications. Uh, the motivation of the secretary was a matter that was addressed uh, with great particularity by the district judge. And it was addressed as well by the court, which said, motivation does not matter. It then immediately turned and said, but in rare cases, it might. And it might here, because here, the real motivation was different than what the secretary said was the reason for the decision. Now, those of you who have much more supple minds than mine can understand how motivation doesn't really matter, how anything that supports a decision suffices as long as you have a reasonable basis for the decision, but that if you have a different motivation than you said you did, that matters, and that's something that can be looked at. Uh, the Chief Justice also said that it was wrong for the district court to order discovery on that matter, but that since after the district court did that, it got information that showed that the secretary's reason was merely pretextual, it was going to allow the discovery to stand and to base a reversal and a remand on the basis that the secretary's decision was pretextual. I, I think this is a terrible thing for the court to be doing. And I think it's terrible, not because I think it's good to, to lie to courts about your real reason, but because I think it's the wrong thing for the courts to be in the business of trying to look into the motives of official decision makers. Uh, imagine that you're a, a judge looking at a decision from a judge in the court below. And the argument of counsel is, Your Honor, I know that the district judge said this and that and the next thing. But that wasn't really what his motive was. He really is a biased person. This is an Obama judge, or a Trump judge, or a Clinton judge, or someone that's biased against this administration. And therefore, you should look at his background. You should look at what it is that he has done in his life, and take that into account when you review his decision. No court's going to do that. And in fact, any suggestion that courts would do that would get great pushback from the Chief Justice first and foremost, as well as from others on the court. 
but asking the courts to look at what the actual subjective motivation of the Secretary of Commerce was is essentially doing the same thing. It's doing it in a context that the court looked at back in the 1940s and resoundingly and clearly and unequivocally rejected as a basis for action. Courts do look at motives in different times, in different cases. A lot of the criminal law, we look at motives. We look, if, if I throw a rock in the direction of someone in the audience, the question is, was I trying to hit them? Was I trying to go over their head and hit the bug on the back wall? We look at what the motive was, but we do that in a context where the real question is, can we limit my liability by showing that I had a motive that was benign? Can we require proof that I had a bad motive before any punishment can attach? Uh, and most of the cases where we do it, we look at objective evidence in making that sort of determination. Here, we're inviting people to challenge the motives of officials, to call the motives of officials into question, and to ask judges to come in and look at those motives and take them into account in second guessing what to do with official actions. This invites the sort of political argument and the sort of political litigation that I think is very destructive of both our politics and our administration. It undermines democratic features of society rather than reinforcing them. It raises the political aspects of argument to the front in cases that generally look not at the politics of the people making the decisions, but at the bases that they have for making them, at what they've articulated, how they've explained them, and whether the explanation suffices as a reasonable explanation for a decision of that sort. Uh, I think that when you start down this road, you are going to incentivize people to bring exactly the wrong sorts of actions with the wrong sorts of claims into court, trying to undo and continue political arguments. Justice Thomas, in one of the many opinions in this case, I think there were fewer uh, opinions than there were justices, but not by many. Um, Justice Thomas, in going through his reasons for disagreeing with this part of the Chief Justice's decision for the court, says at the end that this may be essentially a sport. This may be an argument that is good uh, for only this case, only this day, only this train, only this ride. It is not something to be repeated. I think there is great reason to hope that Justice Thomas is right about that, and some reason to expect it, because it is rare that you have clear evidence on the record that someone was looking for other people to come in and make arguments. Uh, it is rare that a cabinet member would be so clear uh, in seeking another cabinet member to come in and ask for a particular action. It is rare that you have anyone willing to make that sort of request in a way that is discoverable later. And it is rare that a court would really entertain that when there is considerable discretion given over to an administrator. So at the end of the day, uh, while I think that the opinion itself goes off the tracks at the end in finding that a pretext uh, that the real motivation of the secretary was different than that articulated, and that is round, grounds for reversal in this case, I am hopeful that this will prove to be a decision that does not have a, another sequel coming down the track. Uh, and uh, in the end, well, let me just say that while there may be uh, someone who can say that his brother was worse, I'm not sure I will find another decision from the last term I can say quite the same about. Thank you, Ron. Our uh, next panelist will be Jesse Panuccio. Uh, Jesse is an attorney in Washington, D.C. and in Florida. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, he served at the United States Department of Justice and for much of that time 
He was acting assistant attorney general. In that role, Mr. Panuccio oversaw the civil and criminal work of the antitrust, civil, civil rights, environment, and tax divisions. Uh, he also served as DOJ's regulatory reform officer and vice chair of the task force on market integrity and consumer fraud. Uh, Mr. Panuccio served as a law clerk to Judge McConnell of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, uh, received his JD from Harvard and his bachelor's from Duke. Jesse. Thanks very much. I guess you don't have a preference for the podium, do you? I'll None at all. Great. Well, uh, thanks very much for that introduction and uh, to the Gray Center for inviting me here today. Uh, it's a privilege to join these distinguished panelists and the symposium as a whole. Uh, when Adam asked me if I wanted to speak here today and told me the topic, I felt uh, a little bit like Michael Corleone in Godfather 3, <laughs> just when I thought I was out, that he pulled me back <laughs> in uh, to this question. So uh, I served at DOJ during, uh, during nearly the entire pendency of the census litigation. Uh, I left, oh, am I not mic'd up properly? Sorry. Technical difficulties, stand by. Okay, so uh, I served at DOJ near, during nearly the entire pendency of the census case. Uh, I left just before, after it was argued, just before it was decided. Uh, you know, what I can say, I necessarily have to cabin my comments to the public briefing and the public opinion in the case, uh, but I will suffice it to say from the outset, it was an extraordinary piece of litigation. Uh, it stretched, I think, administrative law and the judicial role beyond uh, anything we have previously seen in similar litigation. And indeed, if the resulting Supreme Court opinion is anything more than what Justice Thomas hopes in his partial dissent, which as you heard, was a ticket good for this day and this train only, uh, I think the tectonic plates of administrative law and judicial review may have shifted uh, because of this case. So let me offer six brief observations about the case, and I'll keep them necessarily brief. Uh, not protectable, but brief. I, uh, these are initial reactions. I reserve the right to change my mind, but uh, here they are. First, while the holdings regarding extra record discovery, agency discretion, and pretext are all quite significant, let's not whistle past the holding on standing in the case. While the Department of Justice will typically raise even marginal standing arguments in the lower courts, the Solicitor General does not, does not usually raise insubstantial arguments at the Supreme Court. In its Supreme Court briefs, the federal government devoted about 15% of its total argument pages to the standing issue. So this was not a drive-by argument for the government. Now, on standing, the plaintiffs allege that if the citizenship question is reinstated, harm would flow to them through the undercount that would result. The government argued in response that such an injury would not be the result of government action, but rather of independent and illegal actions by third parties who would violate their legal duty to respond to the census. Further, the government noted this illegal action would itself be premised on speculation that the Commerce Department would violate the law by sharing census responses with immigration authorities. That speculation and attenuated chain of causation, the government argued, was insufficient to satisfy the constitutional, am I still not on? You want me to just go to the podium? I'll just go to the podium to make life easier. We can hear you. Okay. I think the recording is the problem. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, so, as Justice Scalia wrote in Lujan, mm -hmm. restating earlier holdings of the court, the injury for standing purposes cannot be the result of the independent action of some third party not before the court. Somewhat astoundingly, however, in the otherwise highly fractured census opinion, the Supreme Court came to the breezy and unanimous decision, unanimous, all nine justices joined part one of the opinion, that quote, the predictable effect of government action on the decisions of third parties is sufficient to establish standing, even if those actions are illegal and based on speculation that still other illegal action will occur. So it strikes me that the unanimous standing holding in the Department of Commerce may have worked a significant change that is going largely unnoticed. One, as Justice Scalia explained in Lujan, that is fundamental to the separation of powers. So that's observation one. Observation two is about institutional responsibility and interbranch comedy. The Supreme Court held that the reinstatement of a citizenship question does not, does not violate the enumeration clause of the Constitution. And it further stated, quote, we do not hold that the agency decision here was substantively invalid. In other words, it seems likely that a majority of the court would have held that under a new administrative process after a remand, the citizenship question could be reinstated. 
If that's so, then why did the Supreme Court wait until June 27th to render its decision, especially after the government informed the court in January that June was the drop dead date for printing the census form? Now, the petition for certiorari before judgment was filed on January 25th, and the court granted cert on February 15th. But it then set argument for two months later and took another additional two months to decide the case. One could question whether the Supreme Court, in a show of comedy to a co-equal branch, exercised appropriate institutional responsibility in taking so long to decide the case. Yes, the case was litigated relatively quickly by Supreme Court standards, but the court, when it must, has decided significant issues in weeks, days, or even hours. So one could fairly question why the court felt no similar sense of urgency in this case. This, after all, was not some run-of-the-mill agency rulemaking that could simply recommence after the litigation. This was the decennial census, a one-shot deal of immense importance to the functioning of our republic. By the timing of its decision alone, the court dictated a final substantive outcome, even while claiming not to render a substantive holding. Whatever the merits or demerits of the overall opinion, it could be argued that the timing gave it a whiff of something extra-legal, an odor that justices have repeatedly said of late they wish to avoid. Third observation. This is about the census case, but it's really about the case that was decided seven days earlier, Gundy versus United States. Gundy reaffirmed what I call the non-non-delegation doctrine, holding that Congress can delegate essentially unfettered lawmaking power to executive agencies. This, I think, is the key to really understanding the census case. On this score, I have a few subpoints. First point, let's step from the back from the litigation and have what I'll call an intervention moment. Like a drug addict so far gone it can't carry out the basic functions of life, Congress's addiction to delegating its powers has left it an addled and enfeebled branch of the federal government. The framers feared what they called, quote, the enterprising ambition of the legislative branch, but who could possibly have that fear today? The last thing a modern congressman wants to do is make tough legislative decisions. I mean, for goodness sakes, the census is about collecting data for the apportionment of members of Congress. This issue, how to apportion representation among the states, was the critical debate the framers had at the Philadelphia Convention. And yet, even as to this fundamental issue that so affects popular sovereignty and its own affairs, Congress delegated nearly all the substantial decisions to the administrative state directing the Secretary of Con uh, Commerce to conduct the census in such a form and conduct as he, as he may determine, not as Congress may determine. Now this is a symposium about the administration of democracy, so perhaps it's fitting to step back and ask, do we really want the unelected administrative state making even these decisions, or ought Congress exercise a little more control over the instrument that helps determine its own membership? Indeed, perhaps we should even ask, whether Congress has a constitutional duty to do more than it has in the Census Act. The Constitution's enumeration clause states as follows, quote, the actual enumeration shall be made in such a manner as Congress shall by law direct. Is Congress really by law directing the manner of the census when it simply gives to a cabinet secretary the power to direct the census in any form and content as he may determine, not Congress? Second point about the interplay of Gundy in the second census case. When Congress legislates, legislates in a way that doesn't implicate fundamental rights, the court subjects such laws to rational basis review. Under that standard, a law is upheld, as the court put it long ago in FCC versus Beach Communications, if there is any reasonably conceivable state of facts that could provide a rational basis for classification. Indeed, the court has held, quote, it is entirely irrelevant, entirely irrelevant, for constitutional purposes, whether the conceived reason for the challenge distinction actually motivated the legislature. In other words, even if Congress justifies its lawmaking with pretextual reasons, the court will uphold such laws upon any plausible asserted rationale in litigation. This doctrine, the court has noted, is, quote, a paradigm of judicial restraint, end quote. Yet when, the review, when reviewing the exercise of delegated lawmaking power, which the census opinion says must be carried out through reasoned agency decision making, which sounds to me a lot like rational basis, the court will look at evidence of pretext as the census case so starkly demonstrates. The court's opinion articulates plenty of plausible reasons for the Commerce Department to include a citizenship question. 
yet it ultimately credits none of them, instead calling them, quote, more of a distraction. This is a quote from the very end of the opinion. But ask yourself, if Congress had itself legislated the citizenship question back into the census, with the legislative history looking similar to the Commerce Department's administrative record, would the Supreme Court have invalidated the statute? If it followed its prior holdings about rational basis review, surely the answer to that question would be no. So why should review of lawmaking by Congress be different than review of lawmaking by the executive? All that the APA prohibits is arbitrary and capricious agency action, and nothing in those words seems to be more demanding than rational basis. I think the answer goes back to the original sin of gutting any semblance of a non-delegation principle. The Constitution establishes intricate procedures to cabin the legislative power that the framers so feared, bicameralism, presentment, and no small thing, popular election of all of the decision makers, with the majority of them having to face the electorate every two years. But once that awesome lawmaking power is given over almost entirely to another branch of government that has no built-in constitutional safeguards, the need for new protections arises. Accordingly, we see the continual efforts by the judicial branch to police the administrative state's lawmaking, the doctrinal contrivances and contradictions that have ensued, and most recently, the logical head scratching that the census opinion includes. Now, Dean Cass, in his new article about this case, says there have been two derogations from the original constitutional design. The first being abandonment of restraints on Congress's ability to deputize others to exercise its legislative powers, and the second involving excessive intrusion by judges into matters legally committed to administrative discretion. My slight gloss on Dean Cass's point would be that the first derogation creates the perceived need for the second. Wouldn't it just be better and of greater constitutional fidelity to police the delegations of lawmaking power in the first instance? My fourth observation about the census case, and I'm getting to the end, uh, is about George Orwell. In his, 19, in his work, 1984, he co coined the term doublethink. That is, to know and not to know, to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. As Justice Thomas's dissent points out in the census case, it is pretty difficult to square the two halves of the Supreme Court's opinion. On the one hand, the court's opinion says, the evidence before the secretary supported his decision. That's a quote. And quote, the choice between reasonable policy alternatives in the face of uncertainty was the secretary's to make. And critically, that the secretary's policymaking discretion and value-laden decision-making need not be subordinated to an agency's technocratic expertise. Further, the opinion says an agency can be, quote, influenced by political considerations or prompted by an administration's priorities and can have, quote, unstated reasons in, in addition to stated reasons. And then, with little explanation, the court casts all of that aside, holding that the secretary's decision cannot stand because it was appropriate for the district court to order invasive discovery and that evidence in the administrative record and outside of the administrative record made the decision seem pretextual. So although the decision pays lip service to not allowing, and this is a quote, rarefied a rarefied technocratic process, end quote, to control final agency decision making, make no mistake about what's going on in that opinion. It empowers rarefied technocrats because it empowers the rarefied technocrats because those are the agency officials and employees who create the administrative record. And the court has now offered an incentive for the permanent bureaucracy to seed the record with landmines that will justify abusive discovery of presidentially appointed leadership. The opinion says such discovery should be rare, but it gives absolutely zero, and you can look through the opinion, zero guidance about what rare circumstances would justify such discovery. I suspect, just as an empirical matter, given the general political orientation of the permanent bureaucracy, that this tool will be used as a one-way ratchet only against certain presidential appointees and administrations. My fifth, and I'll make this my final observation, concerns footnote four in Justice Thomas's partial dissent. There he states, quote, we do not have before us a claim that information outside the administrative record calls into question the legality of an agency action based on unstated, unlawful bias or motivation. Now, Justice Thomas doesn't provide a citation to a case in this footnote, but notice the echoes of the biggest case from the prior term, Masterpiece Cake Shop. 
in which the court held that, quote, the hostility displayed by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission against Jack Phillips, the baker in that case, invalidated its decision on free exercise grounds. The court looked at process and motive. It did not issue an underlying holding about the outcome of the Colorado Commission's decision. So I would just say this, to be fair and, and, and talk about both sides of this. In considering and critiquing the use of motive evidence by government administrators in the wake of the census decision, we should also be mindful of the full range of cases in which such issues might arise and how you might want them to be used in those different uh, areas. With that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Our final panelist is Allison Ho. Allison is the co-chair of the Appellate and Constitutional Law Practice Group at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. She has argued multiple times before the U.S. Supreme Court and presented over 50 oral arguments in federal and state courts nationwide. Allison served as the special assistant to President George W. Bush, counsel to Attorney General John Ashcroft, and she was a law clerk to Justice O'Connor of the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Wiener for the Fifth Circuit. Allison is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, where she was a member of the Law Review. Thank you. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I know that when I'm among, it's a beautiful sunny day outside, it's a Friday afternoon, um, and you all are here, sitting here to talk about administrative law. I know I'm among my people. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for having me. It's just a privilege to be a part of this very important discussion today. And I, I bring, as, as my bio might suggest, I bring a litigator's perspective to the discussion. And I want, I want to back up a little bit and put, uh, kind of use the census decision um, as one bookend and another very important administrative law decision from last term, which was the Kaiser versus Wilkie case uh, where the court um, very regrettably, in my view, and I'm sure to a lot of you in this room, pulled back from formally overruling uh, our and Seminole Rock deference, whereby courts are required to defer to agencies' interpretation of their own regulations. And sort of if you think about the census case and Kaiser, I'm sort of reminded of the old joke um, about the two old ladies who were complaining about a restaurant that they'd recently eaten at, and one of them said, oh, the food was terrible. And the other lady says, yes, in such small portions. <laughs> um, I kind of feel that way in, in, in Kaiser. Um, you had a situation where, where essentially the court was being asked to reassert uh, the proper role of courts um, as saying what the law is and not delegating that task to an administrative agency. Um, you could see the census case as sort of the flip side of that where, and I think this with this motive discussion, where you had the court asserting a right to intrude in an area uh, where courts have been loath to go before in this particular context precisely because of the danger, and it's a word that's overused, but weaponization is really the word that comes to my mind here in terms of the door that the court has opened. So if you could see the problem with the census case in terms of sort of excessive intrusion um, into the affairs uh, beyond the, the court's ken, um, whereas the decision in Kaiser versus Wilkie is almost a self-imposed abdication. Um, so the court in one case is intruding where it shouldn't be, and in another case it's, it's sort of holding back in an area where it should be exerting itself. I found it interesting, if you think of the lineups in the two cases, um, in the Kaiser case, uh, you had essentially the Chief Justice being the swing vote and being the deciding vote in the, in, in the court's decision to refrain, to pull back from overruling Kaiser, uh, overruling Seminole Rock and our deference. And you had Justices Thomas, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh 
sort of prominent in the dissent in that case. In the census case, it's the same, same dynamic where you have the chief justice being not just the swing vote, but as you said, Dean, the, the only, <laughs> the, deciding, uh, the deciding vote, if you will, um, among that. And then in this, and you had Justice Thomas writing a dissent. And I found Justice Gorsuch's dissent in the Kaiser case um, very interesting read together with Justice Thomas's dissent in the census case. And let me kind of play, play that out. In, in, his, in his dissent in a Kaiser case, um, Justice Gorsuch referred to the Administrative Procedure Act, and this is a quote, as basically the constitution for our administrative state. You go forward and you look at Justice Thomas's partial concurrence, partial dissent in the census case, um, Justice Thomas begins by focusing on the APA's text, and he calls out what the APA specifically lists as bases for judicial review, and he points out that it does not list motive among them. So one way to think about the census decision is if you think about sort of substantive due process, right, where the court, many would say, I would say, right, the court has read things into the Constitution, has read substantive rights into the Constitution that are not there. I think you could, you, you could in some way say that this, in the census case, is similar with respect to the Administrative Procedures Act, that the court has essentially read, um, and I talk about it as a substantive right, I think probably the other side would quibble with that, but I think if from, the, from the standpoint of the door that it's opened and the right that it gives, and I, I could not agree more with my fellow panelists that talk about, um, I, I, I share Justice, I hope Justice Thomas is right, as I hope he is right about just about everything. Um, I fear that the problem is not just um, once you get into court, would you be willing to win um, based on the use of motive. My fear and my concern, and I think about this too in the concern of if you think about what has been argued in the standpoint of how our deference and seminal rock deference affects agency decision making. In terms of if you think about the argument of well, if an agency knows that a court is going to have to defer to basically any, any reading of its own interpretation as long as it passes kind of minimal standards of reasonableness. Um, I have argued, others have argued, um, that that has a terrible ex ante effect beyond just the litigation. I have the same concern about opening the door. In other words, even if, that, even if the door in terms of using motive as a possible ground to challenge agency action, even if we've only opened that door a little bit, you have to bake into the concern there the um, ad terrorum effect on that. Not unlike, say, I think it's, it's well understood now that if, if a class action is brought against a company, even if the action is completely frivolous, the sheer size of that litigation can be enough in some cases to where companies make rational decisions to settle even frivolous lawsuits because of the expense and cost of the litigation itself. And so I think one, one concern here is e even, even if uh, Justice Thomas is right that in terms of judicial decision making, this is a, this is a ticket for one day only. Um, you have to imagine how just the specter, um, both, from, both from the standpoint of political actors um, and being, being sort of goaded into decisions based on threat of not just litigation, but I think the discovery aspect of this is really important and sort of it, it calls to my mind too the class action context, right? Where e even, even though the court made clear, I think, that it didn't approve of the discovery, it went on and sort of, you know, blessed it in hindsight and used the discovery. 
I think the threat of discovery itself, and you don't, you don't have to have a lot of creativity to imagine a litigant going into a friendly jurisdiction, a friendly venue, and saying, well, I think, I think this, you know, this is what the state of motive was, but I, I think there may be more, so I'm entitled to discovery to try to figure out what the real motive is. Um, and again, may, maybe, you'd, maybe, maybe you'd win that case at the end of the day, um, but it can be a long slog to get there. And maybe just the threat of the litigation or just having to have the discovery fights um, is enough to chill, to chill behavior in a way that I think we're, we're accustomed to talking about with respect to agencies and the hour and Seminole Rock deference, deference points. I think um, you know, both of these decisions, both Kaiser and the census case really put front and center the proper role of the courts in dealing with the administrative state. And my, my concern is that, again, they're each a bookend. On the, one, on the one case with Kaiser versus Wilkie, you have the court sort of refraining and holding back from performing its function, um, which I think, I think it was Justice Thomas, one of the things I really liked, among wonder, some wonderful things in his concurrence and dissent in the census case. He pointed out that the Administrative Procedures Act commands the courts to determine legal questions by their own rights. So my, my fear is that going forward, you know, it's, again, it's like the ladies complaining about the you know, terrible food and such small portions. We have on the one hand courts that refrain, that abdicate their responsibility under the Administrative Procedure Act, and I would argue under the separation of powers principle in our Constitution of saying what the law is. And on the other hand, you have the census case op opening up, uh, again, we can debate how, how big or how small the opening is, um, for, for courts to wade in and be dealing with questions of motivation, which is especially disappointing when you think of how far we've come in terms of how legislative history is viewed. Now, I think, Jesse, you made a great point about what, what if Congress had passed this as a statute, and you almost feel like it's rolling back the clock. We've we've made a lot of a lot of strides into understanding why legislative history is so unreliable. If legislative history is unreliable, I sort of don't even want to think um, about uh, what uh, records of agency action or administrative uh, records can be manipulated. In the same way that we've now come to understand, we don't give a lot of credit to legislative history precisely because we've seen how subject it is. To, to manipulation. So again, I, 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 what's Yul saying, um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. Um, I, hope, um, I hope Justice Thomas is right, that this is a one ticket for one day only. I hope Justice Gorsuch is right, that even though the court refrained from formally overruling uh, our in Seminole Rock, it is, in his wonderful phrase, zombified. Uh, deference to the extent that uh, it's it's all but dead, um, but but as someone who litigates for a living, um, I I do fear um, that we are we are going to see more of the same in both of these both of these both of these areas in ways that should concern all of us um, who are deeply concerned about the administrative state and the court's roles and that. So thank you. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> Before I turn this over to audience questions, um, I just want to perhaps discuss a, a point of disagreement uh, among the panelists. I think, uh. I think uh, everyone agrees, uh, shares the same hopes and fears regarding the opinion, uh, along with Justice Thomas, but I think a, a point of disagreement might be on the predictive element of that. Um, and Jesse, you mentioned that this, this really does stretch the constitutional boundaries, um, but Dean Cassie seemed to to I think think more believe more strongly in the hope um, that that Justice Thomas might be correct and uh, and Allison you mentioned those the the uh, the fearful implications of discovery so I was thinking um, can we just nail down a prediction for um, how how big this case really is mm -hmm. going forward um, and maybe the reasons behind that well uh, I'm happy to, to jump in here I, I'd actually like to draw a thread through the the three cases. Uh, not just the commerce case, but the, the other two that Jesse and Allison put on the board, which are Gundy and Kaiser. Mm -hmm. um, in Gundy, you have the question, uh, what can Congress delegate to administrators? And 
you have there an approval of the delegation there, but you have enough said by enough justices, including Justice Alito in concurrence, saying that they are open to looking in an appropriate case again at the non-delegation doctrine. And the, the clear sense is that there are at least four and maybe five votes for reinvigorating an actual non-delegation doctrine. In Kaiser, uh, zombified is, is a good word. I have a, a piece in, in the Penn uh, Review on Regulation that uh, is titled, I think, uh, Dead Man Walking. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, in fact, in Kaiser, even though they don't overrule our, um, they do say enough about it. Now, you know, Gundy was about what you can delegate. Kaiser is about what role the court should play, what deference it should give administrators in essentially making decisions on legal questions. And in Kaiser, it's making decisions on legal questions where the actual statute doesn't clearly give deference, give discretion in the statute. Um, and, and I think after Kaiser, our doesn't really exist. Seminole Rock is a different case. Um, the, the, and, and this isn't the right time to go into that in detail. But Seminole Rock, I would say, is still there. Our is not, except in name. Uh, it's just a fiction uh, that is there now. Um, the Commerce case, uh, again, I think they went so far. There, the, the question there is how do we review discretion that actually has been given to an agency on matters that are not core legal issues. And in that case, it was uh, on reinstating a question that had been asked in almost every census for 230 years. Um, so it's not doing something that's crazy, unreasonable. It's something that the court finds is reasonable and justified. And uh, it, it, it ought to have ended the case there. Um, I think that we are likely to see that a non-delegation doctrine of some sort will reappear, notwithstanding Gundy, mm -hmm. that our will remain dead, notwithstanding Kaiser, although it, it will need last rights still, um, and that commerce will turn out to be something of a sport, although it may come back at some point to haunt us if it is not clearly put to bed. Let me just react to that. Um, so I do have I guess kind of a different view of commerce. So if you look at uh, what was going on in district court litigation against the administration well, for the first two and a half, two, three years, uh, commerce was not the only case where we were seeing incredibly abusive, invasive discovery requests by states and plaintiff groups being credited by district courts in ways that were simply unforeseen. You know, all the debates about the nationwide injunctions, how abusive that was. What was going on sort of sub silentio, but, but also happening was this incredibly abusive discovery uh, for extra record discovery. And I think the Supreme Court, by essentially saying, well, maybe it was wrong, but it was probably right, and then giving no guidance, has given a blank check to district court, commerce was supposed to be the bulwark against this. This was supposed to be the case where the Supreme Court said, enough district courts, enough. Stop, you know, get back into the judicial role. And instead, it offered a blank check for district courts and plaintiffs to do this. So I think uh, you will see this cited everywhere. And I think the interim effect that you point out, Allison, is, is going to be there. And I actually have the same view, just you know, as an aside, of Kaiser. I think far from being uh, zombified, by creating all of these sub-questions that now need to be answered before a district court or a appellate court can invoke our deference, what the court has really done is said, okay, Department of Justice, okay, private plaintiffs, get out there and litigate these 15 new sub-questions that we came up with, do it for the next 20 years, and then we'll do this whole thing again in 20 years and decide if we really want our deference. So I think the court, when it does these breezy rulings with almost no explanation of when is the rare circumstance you can have discovery actually does great damage at the district court level. Well, that's uh, certainly two different predictions. Um, we could probably have a whole symposium just on this case uh, discussing Kaiser and nationwide injunctions and non-delegation. Um, do we have time for some audience questions, one or two?
Thanks. I'm Jeff Lovers from American University. Um, very interesting presentation. I, I know better than to disagree with Dean Cass too much, but um, <laughs> I, and I, I thought your last summation was probably a good prediction. Um, but I think um, some of the readings of the cases were a bit extreme in my view. Um, I think that in, 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 in Kaiser, for example, the, and, and Chief Justice Roberts played the key role in, in both Kaiser and in the census case, right? So in, in Kaiser, he basically accepted Neil Francisco's argument as Solicitor General. And then in the end, he says, you know, there's not that big of a difference between Justice Kagan's position and Justice Gorsuch's position. And, and what she did, in her opinion, was basically codify the whittled down version of Kaiser and added a few more whittles. So I don't think it's, you know, such a dramatic decision. Um, secondly, with respect to the census case, uh, I, th I think there, I agree that it's probably a one-off because as you said at the end of your presentation, Ron, um, this was a rather extreme set of facts. And I don't, I don't think you're gonna see factual situations like this. It reminds me of another case that I teach in my ad law class, which is the Pillsbury case from long ago on, 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 on the question of when, con what, when it might violate due process for Congress to interfere in a pending administrative adjudication. And in that case, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing and they criticized the FTC for being too weak on the Pillsbury case that was pending. And that's, that created a black letter law. It's what we call a prophylactic rule. And Congress knows not to cross that line. And I think now after this case, um, the census case, the agencies know not to um, prevaricate in the way that they did in this case. And so I don't really see what's wrong with the decision if you view it that way. Personally, I think it's more of a garden variety, arbitrary and capricious case, but I know we disagree on that. But, but given the fact that it's probably a one-off in an extreme situation, I'm not sure why you're so critical of Chief, Chief Justice Roberts in, in making that decision. And it's, some people have said that he switched, switched sides in that case late in the day. That may account for the timing. Um, and maybe changed his vote because he was kind of fed up with uh, what, what had been going on below. Well, I, I never uh, want to speculate on what happened in the court. Um, I, I do think, and I, while I'm optimistic, um, I'm optimistic about where the law will end up. I'm, I'm not uh, denying, I, I think, that uh, Jesse and Allison uh, are both right that there will be plenty of arguments o over the coming uh, few years based on this score, uh, based on arguments about what is in the president's mind, uh, trying to extrapolate from tweets or side comments about what's going on in, in the administration. And I think clearly that if you have a rule that is basically subjective, it gives uh, a real incentive for people to find judges whose subjective evaluations will match their own. So I, I am concerned about the interplay with nationwide injunctions. I'm concerned about uh, what this does to litigation. I, I still think that it won't be that long before the court finds a way of saying that was an extraordinary case, uh, which doesn't mean it's the last time you'll hear about it. But I, I do think it will cabinet somewhat. Um, the same way with, with uh, Kaiser, um, even though uh, the court doesn't say our is dead, it does put so many caveats on it and so many restrictions on it. I, I think effectively uh, you will need a, a very headstrong lower court to invoke our. Um, and I also think that Kaiser sends some hopeful signals, uh, signals about possible reforms to Chevron, because a lot of what is said there, um, even in Justice Kagan's opinion, I think is consistent with revisiting uh, Chevron, tying it more clearly to actual delegations to an agency. All right, that's about time. So please join me in thanking our panel.